The mere mention of his name would evoke fear in the heart of every devil, wrongdoer, and oppressor. He effortlessly balanced power and humility, dominance and justice, decisiveness and compassion. Superpowers fell to their knees before him, and the splendors of the world were at his feet, yet he shunned it all and continued his voyage to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His name is second only to Abu Bakr in the golden list of the ten guaranteed paradise. He is of course none other than Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Once a camel escaped the Muslim treasury, and rather than summon a stable boy to retrieve the camel, Umar without a moment's hesitation chased after the camel under the scorching blaze of an Arabian sun. He understood he was ultimately responsible for the Muslim treasury, and he would be answerable before Allah for it. It was said to him, you have humbled the leaders who will come after you, O Umar. That is to say, his action was not common practice for a leader, and that in doing so, he had set a difficult precedent of humility for future Muslim leaders. Umar's reply, however, was wonderful. It demonstrated his awe-inspiring level of consciousness. He said, Ya Abal Hassan, father of Hassan, La talumni, don't blame me. Fawaladi ba'atha Muhammadan bin Nubuwa. I swear by the one who sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with prophethood. Law anna inaqan ukhidat bishati il furati la ukhida biha umaru yom al qiyama. If an animal was to be taken by any harm next to the river Euphrates, i.e., miles away from Medina, he said, I would be accountable for it on the day of judgment. Despite leading an empire that stretched across the known world, Umar did not consider it beneath him to personally tend to his flock. He was once seen with his head close to the ground, kindling a fire for a hungry family in the middle of the night as its smoke passed through his beard. The head of state then fed the children with his own hands until they were satiated and they fell asleep. The children's mother looked with appreciation at this friendly stranger and she found no way to express her admiration other than by saying, Jazakallahu khayran, anta awla al amri min Umar. May Allah reward you with goodness. You are worthier of being the caliph than Umar, not knowing that her visitor that evening was in fact Umar, the caliph himself. When discussing this giant of a man, where should a person begin? Should one start with listing his conquests or his sheer consciousness of Allah? Or should we describe his justice and equity? Should we recall his command and courage? Should we recall his rejection of this material world or his knowledge and iman? Let us perhaps begin with his first tentative steps to Islam. It all began with dua. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once called upon Allah saying, Allahumma a'izz al-Islam bi'ahabbi hadayni rajulayni ilayk. O Allah, I ask you to bring honor and dignity to Islam by guiding one of the two men whom you love more, Umar ibn al-Khattab and Abu Jahl. Ibn Umar, who is the narrator of this narration, he said, the most beloved of these two men to Allah was Umar. Umar described his journey to Islam when he said, Before I became a Muslim, I was a man who loved wine. I would drink it regularly. There was a particular place in Mecca where the men of Quraysh would gather to drink together. On one particular night, I went looking for my friends so that we could drink together as usual, but I did not find any of them. So I said to myself, perhaps I should go and see so and so. He may have wine with him. I went to him, but he was not around either. I then said to myself, well, I might as well pay the Kaaba visit and circumambulate around it seven times. So I went and upon arriving, I saw the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praying facing Palestine. Of course, this was before the direction of the prayer was changed, but he had kept the Kaaba ahead of him. So I said to myself, why not listen to what he is saying in his prayer? But I knew that if I was to go near him, this would alarm him. So I stealthily sneaked up to the Kaaba from the opposite side and I hid myself under its curtain. Omar says, now that I was beneath the curtain, I gradually started to make my way around the Kaaba until I was face to face with the Prophet وسلم, as he prayed, with the curtain of the Kaaba being the only barrier between me and him. At that moment, the Prophet وسلم, was reciting Surah Al Haqqa from the Quran. Umar says, I said to myself, This must be poetry, just like the people of Quraysh said it was. Just as this thought came to me, 
Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam happened to recite the verse where Allah says وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرْ قَلِيلًا مَا تُؤْمِنُونَ This is not the word of a poet but little do you believe. As if struck by a thunderbolt, Umar froze in his tracks. He thought then this must be the word of a soothsayer. And the Prophet continued with the next verses وَلَا بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنْ قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ Nor is it the word of a soothsayer. Little do you remember. تَنْزِيلٌ مِنْ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ It is a revelation from the Lord of the worlds. Umar then said, فَلَمَّا سَمِعْتُ الْقُرْآنَ رَقَّ لَهُ قَلْبِي وَبَكَيْتُ وَدَخَلَنِي الْإِسْلَامِ When I heard these words, my heart softened and I began to cry and the love of Islam fell into my heart. Umar said, I stayed exactly where I was until he finished praying and left. But I followed him. He heard my footsteps, so he turned and recognized me. He thought that I had come to harm him. So he addressed me with firmness and he said, What brings you here at this time of the night, O Umar? Umar's response was, I have come to believe in Allah and his messenger and that which has come from Allah. The Messenger وسلم, praised Allah and made dua for him and he asked Allah to keep him steadfast and the Prophet وسلم, patted him gently on his chest three times and he said each time Allahumma akhrij ma fi sadrihi min ghillin wa abdilhu iman Oh Allah, I ask you to remove any ill feelings from his heart and replace it with iman and from this day forth, Umar dropped his whip along with every other evil sentiment that he had previously harbored towards Islam Umar's acceptance of Islam immediately benefited the da'wah in Mecca. A personality like his was not to be taken lightly. And this is why Suhaib al-Rumi, one of the earliest companions who embraced Islam, he said, Lama aslam Umar, when Umar became a Muslim, ظهر al-Islam, Islam increased in prevalence. وَدُعَيَ إِلَيْهِ alania, And we would call towards it now publicly. وَجَلَسْنَا حَوْلَ الْبَيْتِ حِلَقًا And we would sit in circles around the Kaaba. And we would circumambulate around it. And we would retaliate when spoken to nastily. Umar's conversion to Islam was transformative. From a hedonistic man chasing the fleeting pleasures of endless socializing, bin drinking and idle talking, Umar became the legend we all know and celebrate today. His story serves as a reminder that it is not people who make Islam great, but it is Islam that carves out greatness in people. How many of us weep to Allah begging him for one short dream of the Prophet Muhammad We wish to cast a glance at his luminous face to perhaps hear words that would strengthen us upon our path as Muslims. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man ra'ani fil manami faqad ra'ani, fa inna shaytana la yatakhayyalu bi. Whoever has seen me in a dream, then no doubt he has seen me, for shaytan cannot imitate my shape. Those who have been blessed to see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a dream profess that their lives were never the same again. How it must propel a person forward on his journey to Allah. Imagine then how you would feel if one morning the Prophet ﷺ said to you, I saw you in my dream last night. Bearing in mind that the dreams of the Prophets are not like ours, they are always true. Indeed, they are revelations from Allah. And it wasn't too long after Umar accepted Islam that he began to appear in the dreams of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. On one morning, the Prophet said, Bayna ana na'im, whilst I was sleeping, Id ra'aytuni fil jannah, I saw myself in paradise. Fa'idha mara'atun tawadda ila janibi qasrin, I came to notice a woman who was making wudu by the side of a palace made from solid gold. Fa'qultu, I said, Liman hadha, who does this palace belong to? And they said to me, it belongs to Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiyallahu anhu. The Prophet ﷺ then commented by saying, فَوَلَّيْتُ مُدْبِرًا In my dream, I then remember turning away from this woman, having remembered the jealousy of Umar. How beautiful and complete were his manners. The Prophet ﷺ avoided causing any grief to his companions even within his dreams. And Abu Hurairah, the narrator of this incident, he said, فَبَكَ Umar. Umar began to cry. وَنَحْنُ جَمِيعًا And we all began to cry in that gathering. Umar then said, بِأَبِي أَنْتَ وَأُمِّي يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَعَلَيْكَ أَغَارِ May my mother and father be sacrificed for you, O Messenger of Allah. How could I possibly become jealous of you? The Prophet ﷺ saw Umar again in his dreams, this time vividly capturing the depth of Umar's iman. The Prophet ﷺ said, Bayna ana na'im, while I was sleeping, Ra'aytu nasa yu'raduna alayya wa alayhim qumus. I saw people being presented to me who were wearing shirts. Minha ma yablughu thudiyya wa minha ma yablughu duna dhalik. 
Some of their shirts came down to their chests and others were shorter than that. Then Umar appeared in the dream and he was wearing a shirt that was dragging all along the ground. The companions, they asked him, ماذا أولت ذلك يا رسول الله? How did you interpret this dream, O Messenger of Allah? And he said, الدين. It is his religious commitment. Allahu Akbar. A prophetic testimony to the Iman of Umar. But it doesn't stop that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw Umar in his dreams on a third occasion. The Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam said, Bayna ana na'im, while I was sleeping, إذ رأيت قدحا أتيت به فيه لبن A cup of milk was brought to me, and I drank until I saw its wetness coming from beneath my nails. Then I passed over the vessel to Umar ibn al-Khattab to drink the remains. And so the companions, they said to him, فَمَا أَوَلْتَ ذَلِكَ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ How did you interpret this, O Messenger of Allah? He said, العلم, it is knowledge. As if becoming a habit of our Prophet, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Umar in his dreams on a fourth occasion and he said while I was sleeping I saw myself at a well that I was taking water from to give to people then Abu Bakr came and he took the bucket from me to give me rest he took out two buckets of water and there was weakness in his drawing of water and Allah forgives his weakness then Umar ibn al-Khattab came and took the bucket from Abu Bakr the bucket transformed into a huge barrel and I have never seen anyone draw water with as much strength as Umar did. He went on doing so until the people left after being fully satisfied while the water well was overflowing with water. Now of course this dream does not indicate that Umar's status is somehow higher than that of the first caliph Abu Bakr but it refers to the duration of the caliphate of Abu Bakr when compared to that of Umar's. Abu Bakr's authority lasted just over two years while Umar led the Islamic nation for 10 years and 6 months. This was a decade during which the Ummah celebrated conquest after conquest. The two greatest empires at the time, the Byzantine and Persian empires, fell in succession to the irresistible Muslim advance. Other lands we now take for granted as Muslims such as Egypt and Iraq were also liberated by the armies sent by Umar. Islam, which had been under threat of annihilation in the plains of Badr, only a few years earlier suddenly became a superpower. In this context, the dream of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, of drawing water from a well was manifested. It wasn't just paradise that Umar was promised. He was also promised jihad and martyrdom. Umar would not die a normal death and he was well aware of this. And when the Prophet وسلم, once stood on the Mount of Uhud and it began to shake, the Prophet وسلم, gently struck it with his foot and he said, Stand firm, O Uhud, on top of you is a Prophet, a Siddiq, and two martyrs. And the Prophet and the Siddiq are Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and Abu Bakr respectively. And as for the two martyrs, they were Umar and Uthman. From that day onwards, it was only a matter of time before Umar would attain his martyrdom. Aside from being praised via the Prophet's dreams, Umar was always complimented in the most remarkable manner by the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abdullah ibn Hisham, he said we were once sat with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he had taken the hand of Umar ibn al-Khattab and placed it within his. Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, la anta ahabu ilayya min kulli shay'in illa min nafsi. O Messenger of Allah, I swear you are dearer to me than everything except myself. Here we must bear in mind that these words were words of honesty. Many of us claim unconditional love for the Prophet ﷺ, but our actions sometimes prove otherwise. Umar, however, spoke candidly and the response he received was just as candid. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, لا والذي نفسي بيده حتى أكون أحب إليك من نفسك. No, I swear by the one who possesses my soul. It is not until I become more beloved to you than even your very self. That is to say, you will not be able to ascend to the peaks of Iman, faith, until I, the Prophet, become dearer to you than yourself. And so with no hesitation, Umar at once responded, فَإِنَّهُ الْآنَ Then now it is, O Messenger of Allah, وَاللَّهِ لَا أَنْتَ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ نَفْسِي I swear you are now more beloved to me than even my own self. And upon hearing this, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, الْآنَ يَا عُمَرْ It is now, O Umar. Now the Iman of Umar was complete. Now, given that emotions are not controlled by binary switches, it is a reasonable question to ask how Umar was able to bring about such a huge and rapid change within his heart. 
Imam Al-Khattabi beautifully explained this and he says, the love which one has for himself is instinctive, but the love which one has for others is a conscious choice that we make. The Prophet ﷺ did not request from Umar the instinctive love as no one has control over that. And Umar's first response was an expression of his instinctive love. But he quickly came to realize that the Prophet ﷺ was more beloved to him than himself as the Prophet was the cause of his salvation from the harms of this world and the next. And considering this, Umar pronounced his absolute love for the Messenger not out of instinct but out of choice. In other words, Umar recognized that his life in this world and in the hereafter would have been devastated had it not been for the guidance of the Messenger In the same vein, we should ask ourselves, what would we have known about Allah had the Messenger not endured the hardships of boycott and ridicule and ostracization and bleeding on the battlefield solely in order to convey the message? Which of Allah's names would we be able to invoke? What would we have known about Allah's attributes? Where would we have turned to during our darkest hours if we did not have his words? How cold and dark would the grave be without the light of prayer which our Prophet ﷺ taught us? How terrifying would the day of reckoning be had we lived in disarray without a criterion? And so it is clear that Prophet Muhammad ﷺ should be more beloved to us than our own selves because through him Allah has taught us how to avoid the misery of a godless life today and the horrors of an eternal fire tomorrow. Back to Umar, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once said about Umar ibn al-Khattab, إن الله جعل الحق على لسان عمر وقلبه Allah has placed the truth on the tongue of Umar and on his heart. Now what does this mean? His son, Abdullah, he said, ما نزل بالناس أمر قط فقالوا فيه وقال فيه عمر إلا نزل فيه القرآن على نحو ما قال عمر. He said, never did the people experience a happening wherein they would voice an opinion in its regard. And Umar would voice his opinion, except that Quran would be revealed confirming the opinion of Umar. How incredible it is that verses from the Most High Allah to his Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited by billions of people until the last day are confirming the opinion of Umar ibn al-Khattab and at times even matching his exact words. Umar said, وَافَقْتُ رَبِّي فِي ثَلَاثِ My Lord approved of my opinion on three occasions. فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ لَوْ اتَّخَذْنَا مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى The first occasion was when I once said to the Messenger, O Messenger of Allah, why do we not take the place where Ibrahim stood as a place for prayer? And so Allah revealed a verse from the Qur'an, وَاتَّخِذُوا مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى Take the station of Ibrahim as a place of prayer. The second occasion was when I once said, Ya Rasulullah, law amarta nisa'aka an yahtajibna fa innahu yukallimuhunna al-barru wal-fajr. O Messenger of Allah, why do you not order your wives to cover themselves with the full hijab from the men because the good and the bad people talk to them? He said, فَنَزَلَتْ آيَةُ الْحِجَابِ وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُهُنَّ مَتَاعَ The verses of hijab were revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam subsequently saying, and if you ask of his wives something, then ask them from behind a hijab. And the third occasion was when the Prophet's wives banded together in their jealousy over him. And so I, Umar, said to them, Asa Rabbuhu in Talaka Kunna Ayyubdilahu Azwajun Khairan min Kunna al Ayah. It may be that his Lord, if he, the Prophet, divorces you, will give him instead wives who are better than you, submissive to Allah, believing, pious, penitent, worshipping, inclined to fasting, widows and maids. And so the following verse was revealed to the Prophet وسلم, saying, It may be that his Lord, if he divorces you, will give him instead wives better than you, submissive to Allah, believing, pious, penitent, worshipping, inclined to fasting, widows and maids. It was revealed in the words that Umar ibn al-Khattab uttered. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would also say, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي مَا قَبْلَكُمْ مِنَ الْأُمَمِ مُحَدَّثُونَ فَإِنْ يَكُوا فِي أُمَّتِي أَحَدٌ فَإِنَّهُ عُمَرٌ Among the nations who came before you, there were people who were spoken to, i.e. by angels or through inspiration. They were spoken to. And if there are any such men among my ummah, then Umar ibn al-Khattab is one of them. In fact, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once said, لَوْ كَانَ بَعْدِي نَبِيٌّ لَكَانَ عُمَرٌ If there were to be a Prophet sent after me, he would have been Umar. How can we Muslims possibly find inspiration in any contemporary popular personality, the majority of whom are yet to offer their creator a single prostration when we have the likes of Umar and others from our history of whom we are an extension? 
times where Muslims take role models from sporting or musical arenas rather than personalities from their own magnificent heritage are sad times indeed. If the lives of all of these so-called stars were combined, their value and achievements would fall short of a single hour in the life of Omar. Are they inspired by angels? Are they carriers of truth that's placed on their tongues and hearts? Are they guaranteed paradise like Omar? Greatness is part of your heritage and you are an extension to that heritage. May Allah be pleased with Omar and may he be pleased with those who strive to become like Omar and to revive the biography of Omar and reserve their admiration for the likes of Omar. Seeing that the light of Iman had now infused with the very essence of Omar since the day he embraced Islam, pearls of wisdom became a feature of Omar, speaking eternal truths that will continue to impress till the end of time. I take you on a tour of some of these eternal gems that were uttered by Amir al-Mu'minin Omar. Omar said, Adatu, fi kulli shay'in khayrun illa ma kana min amril Composure is praiseworthy in every matter, except the matters of the hereafter. The Arabs used to despise haste. They used to call it the mother of regret. Omar, however, is correcting a misunderstanding in that this rule should apply to all things with the exception to the matters of the hereafter. In its case, no time is to be wasted in drawing nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making a case for himself herself before death. Life is so short, the competitors for paradise are so many and your Lord is most deserving. When it comes to your journey to the home of the hereafter, you are in a race against time. And according to the Quran, the greater the goal is, the greater one's rush should be towards it. Consider how when speaking about worldly pursuits, the Quran uses the term famshu, walk. But when talking about the journey to prayer, it uses the term fas'aw, proceed. But when speaking about our pursuit of paradise, it uses the term sabiqu, race. But when speaking about our pursuit of Allah, it uses the term fafirru, flee. So not every ambition in life deserves the same amount of effort. Let your slogan in life be the words of the Prophet of Allah Musa who said, وَعَجِلْتُ إِلَيْكَ رَبِّي لِتَرْضَى I rush to you, my Lord, so that you may be pleased. This is the first gem of Amirul Mu'minin Umar. He said, composure is praiseworthy in every matter, except the matters of the hereafter. What other pearls of wisdom did Umar utter? He once said, Hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu. Hold yourselves accountable before you are held accountable. Wazinu a'malakum qabla an tuzanu. And weigh up your own deeds before they are weighed for you. وَتَزَيَّنُوا لِلْعَرْضِ الْأَكْبَرِ يَوْمَ لَا تَخْفَى مِنْكُمْ خَافِيَةً And prepare yourselves for the ultimate court hearing, a hearing when nothing from you shall be hid. فَإِنَّمَا يَخِفُّ الْحِسَابُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ عَمَّنْ حَاسَبَ نَفْسَهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا Because certainly your accountability on the day of judgment will be made easy if you start your accountability today. Allahu Akbar, look at the ethic of businessmen and their level of critique and assessment when it comes to their business. How particular they are to whom they hire, fire, their reaction to losses, their focus on detail and their vision for the future. Yes, the businessman is always in a state of muhasaba, self-accountability. The same can be said about elite athletes. What is it that made Michael Jordan the best basketball player of all time? Well, for starters, his colleagues said that he constantly criticized every aspect of his game, his dunk, his dribble, his jump shot, his three-point range. Again, muhasaba, self-accountability. As a Muslim who believes that life starts post-death, you are the worthiest of those who act upon this ethic of muhasaba self-accountability. So, similar to the examples I shared with you, ask yourself, who have I taken as friends? What strengths am I allowing to go to waste in my life? What weaknesses have I allowed to linger for years? Hold yourself accountable for every word you utter. Was it for Allah? Should I have stayed quiet? Am I showing off? Then ask yourself, was I on top of my five prayers today? A week has passed, but is my iman or knowledge of my religion stationary? Ask yourself, a year has passed, yet my heart is as tough as a rock. Why am I unable to shed a tear in the remembrance of Allah? How beautiful were the words of Al-Hasan al-Basri who said, مَا نَذَرْتُ بِبَصَرِي وَلَا نَطَقْتُ بِلِسَانِي وَلَا بَطَشْتُ بِيَدِي وَلَا نَهَطْتُ عَلَىٰ قَدَمِي حَتَّى أَنظُرْ عَلَىٰ طَاعَةٍ أَوْ عَلَىٰ مَعْصِيَةٍ Never did I glance at a matter, or at a word, or strike something with my hand, or took a step with my foot, except that I first ask myself, is this in the cause of a good deed or a sin? If it is in the former, I proceed, but if it is in the latter, I refrain. This exercise of self-accountability is tough. 
It is one that requires immense courage and intelligence. So if you lose enthusiasm, remember why you are doing it. As Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, and listen to his words again, hold yourselves accountable before you are held accountable. And weigh up your deeds before they are weighed up for you. And prepare yourselves for the ultimate court hearing when nothing from you shall be hid. Because certainly your accountability on the day of judgment will be made easy if you start your accountability today. What other pearls of wisdom did Umar utter? He once said, Man yadkhul mudkhal as-saw'i yuttaham Whoever traverses the pathways of doubt will be doubted. What does Umar here mean? Umar is warning the Muslims, saying to them that if you behave in doubtful ways, then don't expect people to think well of you, nor should you be alarmed when they start talking, whether it's through outlandish dress or the lack thereof, whether it's strange social media posts, unrighteous friends you walk with, or other covert relationships. Realize that people will talk and when they do, blame none other than yourself. People can only judge by what they see, the apparent. So don't give people a reason to doubt your character, nor the religion that you represent. When the Prophet ﷺ was once walking with his wife Safiya back to her home, during the night before returning to the masjid, two men saw him. They lowered their heads and rushed away. At once he called them back and he said, Ala rislikuma innaha Safiya bintu Huyay. He said to them, slow down, wait, this is Safiya, daughter of Huyay. In other words, he is saying to them, this is my wife. I am not walking with a strange woman. They replied, Subhanallah ya Rasulullah, glory be to Allah, O Messenger of Allah. As if to say, we would never doubt you. But he replied, Inna shaytana yajri min al-insani majaraddam. Wa inni khashitu an yaqdhifa fi qulubikuma sharra. Shaytan flows through human like the flowing of blood and I fear that he may place an evil thought in your hearts towards me. So if this was the Prophet's effort in saving his reputation and character from doubt, how then should the effort be for the rest of us who are far lesser than him? And the scholars of Islam have said that this ethic is particularly emphasized with respect to scholars or those who have a following. It is not permissible, they say, for them to engage in matters that will cause them to be doubted even if they have a justification as this will nullify the value of their knowledge. So remove yourself from every situation that may cause disrepute to yourself or the religion that you represent. Omar, he said, whoever traverses the pathways of doubt will be doubted. For shaitan, mankind is a spectrum of potential targets. Some are easy prey, effortlessly swayed by feeble whispers, whilst others strike fear and dread in shaitan's heart. Umar worked tirelessly to be from the latter category until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted it to him. As is well known, shaitan would flee from Umar. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, he said once Umar asked permission to enter upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, while several Qurashi women were sat with the Prophet. They were talking to him and requesting extra financial support with their voices raised. The moment, however, they heard the voice of Umar seeking permission to enter, the women hurriedly got up to veil themselves. This, of course, was before the hijab was made compulsory. The Prophet ﷺ gave permission to Umar, and the moment he entered, he saw the Messenger ﷺ smiling. Umar politely said, May Allah Almighty always keep you happy, O Messenger of Allah, as if to ask what makes you smile. The Prophet ﷺ said, I am astonished at these women who were with me. As soon as they heard your voice, they rushed to cover themselves. Umar said, O Prophet of Allah, you have more right to be feared by them than me. Then Umar turned to the women and he said, O enemies of your own souls, do you fear me and not the Prophet of Allah? They replied, Yes, because you are harsher and fiercer than the Prophet of Allah. And upon hearing this, the Prophet ﷺ said to Umar, O son of Al-Khattab, I swear by the one who possesses my soul. Whenever shaitan sees you treading a path, he looks for a different path to walk away from yours. Allahu Akbar. As far as the devil was concerned, Umar was a hopeless case. I wonder how shaitan behaves when he sees us treading a path. Does he wave his white flag and surrender and retreat? Or does he cynically grin knowing that he has guaranteed a catch for the day? Our individual response to his next whisper will be the answer to this question. For Umar, however, it didn't stop there. 
Abdullah ibn Mas'ud narrated that a man from among the humans once went out and was met by an individual from the jinn who said, Will you wrestle me? If you throw me to the ground, the jinn said, I will teach you a verse from the Quran which if you recite it when entering your house, no devil will enter. So they wrestled and the human being threw him to the ground. The human being then said to him, I see that you're very weak and your forearms are like the front paws of a dog. Are all the jinn like this or is it only you? And he responded, I am of the strongest amongst them. And so let us wrestle again. So they wrestled and again the human being threw him to the ground. So in keeping with his promise, the jinn taught the human being the verse from the Quran. And he said to him, He said, you are to recite ayatul kursi, the verse of kursi. He said, because anyone who recites it when he enters his house, the devil will escape passing wind like that of a donkey. Ibn Mas'ud, who is the narrator, of this incident, he was asked, was that man Umar? And he responded, Man asa an yakuna illa Umar. Who else could it have been other than Umar? It was not only the devils of the jinn who feared Umar, but the devils of mankind as well. Allah tells us that devils are not only the unobservable ones, but that some human beings are devils in their own right as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ عَدُوًّا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنِّ And so we have appointed for every prophet enemies, devils among mankind and jinn. Allah Almighty also said in reference to the devils, مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّةِ they are of jinn and of men. However, we should be more wary of the human devils than those of the jinn because they can be far more wicked, even though many Muslims tremble at the thought of jinns. And indeed, no campfire is complete without a good jinn story. When a devil from the jinn whispers, their protection is simply to remember the name of Allah. At once, the jinn will withdraw, humiliated and disgraced. The matter, however, is altogether different for the devils of mankind. If the whole Quran was to be recited upon them, they may not seize in their wickedness, whisperings, or evil influence. Omar's honor, therefore, of having both categories of devils fear him presents as even more impressive. Our mother Aisha narrates an incident that she would never forget. She said the Prophet ﷺ was once sat down when we suddenly heard children making noise. The Prophet stood up to see what was happening. An Abyssinian woman was dancing. The children had gathered all around her. The Prophet ﷺ called me. He said, Aisha, come and watch. I came to him and I placed my chin over the Prophet's shoulder and watched through the space between his shoulders and head. The Prophet ﷺ asked me several times, have you had enough? And I kept saying no, just to see how much he cared for me. Meanwhile, Umar passed by and at once the gathering dispersed. Upon seeing this, the Prophet ﷺ said, Inni la ila insi wal qad farru min Umar. I see that the devils from among the jinn and the humans have both fled at Umar's arrival. Umar is the name of a man who was feared by the devils of human beings and those of jinn, both fleeing any scene that he was part of. How did Umar develop such a defense against the devil? The answer is not a sophisticated one. Umar would immediately seal any gaps in his life that he felt could lead to the entrance of satanic suggestions. And I share with you one such example. When he was the caliph of the Muslims, Omar once assembled the Muslims calling out into the streets, come to the masjid, as if something detrimental had happened. When all the Muslims had gathered in the masjid, Omar ascended the pulpit. The crowd fell silent, eagerly awaiting the announcement. And as is customary, Omar began by sending salutations on the Prophet ﷺ. And then he made his announcement. He said, Ayyuhan nas, O people, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُنِي أَرْعَى عَلَىٰ خَالَاتٍ لِي مِنْ بَنِي مخزوم. I remember a time when I used to work as a shepherd for my aunts from the tribe of Makhzum. And after a long day's work, they would pay me by giving me a handful of dates or raisins, which would make me so miserable for the rest of my day. He then descended the pulpit and made his way home. The congregation was bemused. One of those bemused individuals was Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, who said to Umar, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, Ma zitta ala an Leader of the believers, you did nothing but humiliate yourself. And Umar's response was phenomenal. وَيْحَكَ يَبْنَ عَوْف Woe to you, O son of Auf. إِنِّي خَلَوْتُ فَحَدَّثَتْنِي نَفْسِي I was sat alone with myself. 
And then I heard myself whispering to me, Anta Amirul Mu'mineen, you are the leader of the believers. فَمَنْ ذَا أَفْضَلْ مِنْكَ So who can be better than you? فَأَرَدْتُ أَنْ أُعَرِّفَهَا نَفْسَهَا And so I wanted to teach my soul a lesson. Subhanallah. Umar wasn't fooled by his very self, let alone an external whispering of a devil. Sins left unchecked grow ferociously much like weeds. We should cut them off at their roots and at their first appearance. A simple glance can be followed by another, then an appointment, then a meeting, and finally a regrettably painful sin that weighs heavily on the back of the sinner. The further along this path a sin is allowed to traverse, the harder it is to overcome. So no matter what sin it may be, be it showing off, self-admiration, substance abuse, extramarital activity, prohibited financial transactions, unlimited use of the internet, abuse of the hijab, cut it off at its root, just as Umar did. When the sin is still in its infancy, when it is still a suggestion, shaitan is weak and so are his plots. This is certain because Allah the Creator himself said that the plot of shaitan is weak. He can't come to you unless you allow him to in the first instance. Therefore, we must blame ourselves for opening the door for him and we cannot blame anyone but ourselves. On the day of judgment, people will insist their misguidance was shaitan's fault, but he will reject this blame. Allah depicts this scene saying, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ Shaytan will say, when the matter has been decided, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ بَعْدَ الْحَقِّ Allah had promised you the promise of truth. وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ And I, the devil, promised you, but I betrayed you. وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ I had no authority over you except that I invited you and you responded to me. So don't blame me. But blame yourselves. I cannot be called to your aid, nor can you be called to my aid. Indeed, I deny your association of me with Allah before. Indeed, the wrongdoers will suffer a painful punishment. So, reject the whispers of shaitan when the sin is still an idea, when the habit is just a, a thought, when the obsession is still just a curiosity. In fact, Umar at times would be heard speaking to himself to ensure that his own internal voice was louder than any potential satanic whispering. Anas ibn Malik narrates, I was once walking with Umar until a wall separated us. I heard him saying from the other side of the wall to himself, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Bakhin Bakhin. Wallahi latattaqiyanna Allah ya ibn al-Khattab ya awla yuhadzibannak. Umar ibn al-Khattab, leader of the believers. Well, 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 I swear you will either fear Allah or Umar or he will punish you. Look at how Umar spoke with himself, ensuring that his internal conscience was a voice louder than any other. Today, many Muslims try to validate their lack of Islamic commitment with arguments that their environment is full of haram and that no one is advising them. Yet, our predecessors, as you just heard, wouldn't wait for other people's advice. They would advise themselves. And that is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Balil insan wa ala nafsihi basira. Man is a witness against himself. Walau alqa Even if he puts forward his excuses. The early generation of Muslims did not allow the welfare of their hereafter to be hinged on other people. They would advise themselves. And this type of self-introspection that I speak of may be achieved with, for example, an inspirational phrase hung over your desk, through listening to Islamic lectures, or through righteous friends that you keep near to yourself. It may even be through a piece of paper which you keep with you. There was a man who used to follow Sufyan al-Thawri, one of our predecessors. He noticed time and time again, Sufyan would take out a piece of paper from a small box. He would look into it and then he would put it away. This man became curious as per what was on the paper. And so it so happened that this paper fell into his hand and on it was written, Sufyan, Udhkur wuqufaka bayna yadayillahi azza wa jal. Sufyan, remember that you shall stand before Allah. Umar would often admonish himself if he was concerned that arrogance, conceit, or a sense of self-importance was trying to creep into his heart. Despite the numerous promises of paradise, he did not allow himself to become complacent for a single moment. It was also known that he would not take part in the funeral prayer of a person who had died unless he saw Hudayf ibn al-Yaman praying upon him first. This was because the Prophet ﷺ had informed Hudayf exclusively of the hypocrites by name. On one day, a man from the hypocrites passed away, and so Hudayf did not pray upon him. Umar asked Hudayf, was he one of them? Hudayf said yes. Umar then 
and said to Hudayfa, Billahi minhum ana. I ask you in Allah's name, am I one of the hypocrites as well? Hudayfa said to him, no. And you are the last whom I will ever inform. Umar exerted a colossal and continual effort to seal all of the possible entrances of shaitan into his life, neutralizing every attack. And we are similarly aware of shaitan's particular entrances into our own lives. We must identify those entrances, lock those doors once and for all, and throw away the key. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would praise the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abdullah, by saying about him, Inna Abdullahi rajulun salih. Abdullah is a righteous person. In most cases, it is such that the religiosity of a parent is transmitted to their children because the first and most effective school of a child is that of his or her parents. Abdullah's righteousness was no doubt cultivated by his father Omar, and many of the prophetic narrations which praise Omar were in fact narrated by his son Abdullah. The hadith wherein the Prophet saw in his dream that he was drinking milk and that he gave the rest to Omar was narrated by Omar's son Abdullah. The hadith wherein the Prophet saw in his dream that Omar was pulling out buckets of water from the pool with great strength was narrated by Omar's son Abdullah. The hadith wherein the Prophet called upon Allah to guide the one whom he loved the most from Abu Jahl and Umar was narrated by Umar's son Abdullah. The hadith wherein Umar speaks of Allah's approval of his many opinions via the Quran was narrated by none other than his son Abdullah. Parents may spend many sleepless nights worrying about their children, be it for their education, their manners, their religiosity, their future. However, what we often fail to appreciate is that when a child sees his parent occupying such a status in the eyes of Allah and his messenger, coupled with the wisest of parental advice, it is only natural that the child will grow up to become a great individual more often than not. If you worry about your child's religious commitment later on in life, then know that the assurance of their faith is largely intertwined with yours. When Prophet Musa السلام, saw Al Khadr repairing a wall belonging to a stingy, miserly community who refused to host them, he asked him why he did that despite their inhospitality. The response of Al Khadr was the following He said, As for the wall which I repaired, it belonged to two orphan boys in the town, and there was beneath it a treasure belonging to them. And there father was a righteous man and your Lord intended that they should attain their full age of strength and take out their treasure as a mercy from your Lord. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved the treasure of these two orphans because of the righteousness of their father. That's why Ibn Kathir he comments on this verse by saying He said this is evidence that a righteous person will be preserved with respect to his offspring and the blessings of his worship will benefit them in this world and the next. This is also why it is narrated that Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib would say to his son, Wallahi inni la atadhakkaruka fa'azidu fi salati min ajli salahi. I swear by Allah, I sometimes remember you, which then pushes me to pray extra prayers for the sake of your righteousness. Be the type of righteous person you wish for your children to become. Following the calamitous death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr carried the Ummah of Islam for two full years, three months and ten days. Just before the angel of death claimed his blessed soul, Abu Bakr summoned several of the companions, seeking their views as per the appointment of Umar. These companions praised Umar with words that he deserved, and as a result, Abu Bakr proceeded with what he had initially considered. He closed all doors of negotiation and selected Umar ibn al-Khattab as the next caliph, Khalifa of the Muslims. There were some, nonetheless, who had reservations. They feared the harshness of Umar. During the life of the Messenger وسلم, his two closest advisors, Abu Bakr and Umar, had represented different but complementary advisory positions. Abu Bakr represented the wing of compassion and subtlety, whilst Umar represented the wing of decisiveness and force. The companions had observed and recognized this, and some were anxious at the prospect of Umar being in power. After Abu Bakr's blessed soul departed from its body, Umar ascended the pulpit to address the Muslims as their new leader and to address their concerns. 
He said, I have been informed that people are afraid of my harshness and severity, saying about me, he was severe during the very presence of the Messenger of Allah, and he was severe whilst Abu Bakr was the Caliph, then what will happen now that he is the Caliph himself? O people, I want you to know that this toughness and harshness of mine has been doubled. However, it shall only be applied on those who oppress and transgress against the Muslims. As for the people of peace and faith, I shall be softer to them than they are to one another. And any tyrant who tries to oppress any when I will put his face on the floor and put my foot over his face until he surrenders to the truth. However, after this, I too am willing to place my face on the floor for the people of goodness and chastity. The conquest that subsequently took place during the time of Umar are beyond the scope of this recording. Such conquests include that of al Qadisiyah, which altered the very geography of the earth, and a battle which can only be compared in its enormity and decisiveness to the Battle of Badr. The conquests also include those of Nahawand, al Madain, Iraq, Egypt, Azerbaijan. They also include his restoration of Palestine to the Muslims, and the collapse of the greatest superpowers of Umar's time, the Byzantine and Persian empires, which fell to their feet and brought about a complete shift of power in the world. His 10 years and 6 months as Caliph of the Muslims can be described as being 10 years of utmost justice, prosperity and bliss achieved through the implementation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine laws upon his land. Omar's final days were drawing nearer, and he knew with certainty that his death would not be by natural causes. There are several indicators that suggest that Omar knew of this prior to his passing. For example, number one, he was one of the two martyrs referred to by the Prophet ﷺ on Mount Uhud. Number two, Omar eagerly sought martyrdom through his dua to Allah. One such frequent dua of his was, Allahumma rzuqni shahadatan fi sabilika waj'al mawti fi baladi rasulika sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh Allah, I ask you to bless me with martyrdom in your path and cause my death to be in the city of your messenger i.e. in Medina and of course this seemed like a far-fetched request because the capital of the Muslim empire was al Medina. it was supposedly a safe haven for the caliph and the Muslims yet Umar would say Allah will bring it if he wills and number three Umar ibn Khattab once delivered a Friday sermon and after praising Allah and making mention of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr he said inni ra'aytu ru'ya ka'anna dikan naqarani naqrataini wa la ara thalika he said, I have seen a dream that a rooster pecked at me twice, and I believe this indicates the nearness of my death. For these three reasons and others, Omar was certain that his murder was both inevitable and fast approaching. His days would be put to an end at the hands of an evil and hate-filled individual who carried the nickname Abu Lu'lu at al-Majusi, a fire worshipper from Persia. Abu Lu'lu'at al-Majusi is the name of a fire worshipper from Persia who worked for a companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the name of al-Mughira ibn Shu'bah. Al-Mughira used to deduct four dirhams from Abu Lu'lu'a's wage every day. Grieved by his master's conduct, he approached Umar and he said, O leader of the believers, Al-Mughira is taking too much from me. Ask him to reduce it. Umar said to him, Fear Allah and be good to your master. Meanwhile, Omar intended to speak to Al-Mughira to ask him to reduce it and have mercy upon Abu Lu'lu'a. Abu Lu'lu'a, however, became engulfed in fury and he said, The justice of Omar extends to everyone except me. And so Abu Lu'lu'at al-Majusi entered the masjid and he hid behind one of the pillars concealing within his cloak a poison double-edged dagger. Amr ibn Maymun witnessed the scene and he described it by saying, On the day that Omar was stabbed, I was standing and there was nobody between me and him except Abdullah ibn Abbas. Whenever Omar passed between the two rows, he would say, Stand in straight lines. When he saw no defect in the rows, he went forward and started the prayer with takbir, i.e. by saying Allahu Akbar. He used to recite Surah Yusuf or Surah An-Nahl or their likes in the first unit of prayer so that those who would arrive late had time to join the prayer. Immediately after he said the takbir, I heard Omar proclaim, the dog has eaten me as the murderer stabbed him. Abu Lu'lu'a mercilessly thrust the poison dagger into Omar's body multiple times after which he turned his attention to the congregation, stabbing indiscriminately the criminal wounded 13 unarmed companions seven fatally. His murderous rampage was finally stopped by a companion who threw a cloak over him and Abu Lu'lu'a realized he had no escape and he ended his own life. 
those who were standing by the side of Umar saw what I saw. Amr ibn Maymun, he said. But the people who were in the other parts of the masjid did not see anything. They could no longer hear the voice of Umar and were saying, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf led the people with a short prayer. When he finished, Umar, he said, O oh, ibn Abbas, find out who attacked me. Ibn Abbas inquired and eventually came back to Umar and said it was the slave of Al Mughira, i.e., Abu Lu'lu'a. Umar said, The craftsman? Ibn Abbas said, Yes. Umar said, May Allah curse him. I treated him kindly, but alhamdulillah that my death came not at the hands of a man who claims to be a Muslim. Amr ibn Maymun, he continued saying, Umar was then carried to his house and we went along with him. The people were as if they had never suffered a calamity before this one. Some were saying, It's going to be okay, while others they said, We fear for his life. A drink infused with dates was brought to him and he drank it, but alas, the drink flowed from his cut, open belly. Milk was then brought to him and he drank it, and in a similar way it flowed out from his wound. At this moment, the people realized that he would die. People flocked to the bedside of Umar and others began to praise him. One particular young man approached him and said, O leader of the believers, I give you good news from Allah for your close companionship of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and for your superiority in Islam that you know of. You became the caliph, you ruled with justice and finally you have been martyred. Umar replied, Laytani ibn akhi wa dhalika kafafan la alayya wa lali. I wish that all of these things which you mention will offset my sins, causing me no loss or gain in the end. When the young man turned to leave, his clothes seemed to be touching the ground. Omar said, call the young man back to me please. And when he returned, Omar said, يا ابن أخي ارفع ثوبك فإنه أبقى لثوبك وأتقى لربك Oh brother, lift your clothes from the ground for this will be better for your clothes and this will be more pious. Allahu Akbar. Think about how Umar at this moment is hemorrhaging, how the Ummah was about to bid farewell to its caliph. Anxiety had reached its peak, and yet despite the magnitude of these circumstances, Umar was still concerned with this young man's lengthy garment and found the energy to advise him. This is the nature of a Muslim, a lantern of light at all times. Wherever he or she finds himself, herself, and whatever the scenario may be, they continue to enjoin good to forbid evil without belittling the reward of any potential advice. Umar then fixed his thoughts on his grave and the place of his burial. He turned to his son Abdullah and said to him, "Intalik ila Aisha ta Ummi al-Mu'minina, faqul yaqra'u alayki Umar al-Salam, wa la taqul Amir al-Mu'minin, fa inni lastu al-yawma lil-Mu'minina Amiran, wa qul yastadhinu Umar an yudfana ma'a sahibihi." Go to Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the mother of the believers, and say to her, "Umar gives you salam, but do not say Umar the leader of the believers, because today I am no longer the leader of the believers." Say to her. Umar ibn al-Khattab asks you for permission to be buried alongside his two friends. Here he was referring to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Abu Bakr, both of whom were buried within the apartment of Aisha. Imagine breathing your last few breaths knowing the soil will be your home in a few moments. Most would be in a sheer state of panic due to the turbulence of death. Ponder however at the steadfastness of Umar as he during his dying moments arranged his own funeral. Abdullah greeted our mother Aisha and asked for permission to enter. After being granted it, he entered and he found her sitting and heavily weeping. He said to her, Umar ibn al-Khattab gives you salam, and he asks if you will give him permission to be buried alongside his two friends. Our mother Aisha responded, Kuntu uriduhu li nafsi wa la uthiran al-yawma ala nafsi. I had reserved this spot for my own grave, however I will prefer Umar over myself today. When Abdullah returned, it was said to Umar, Abdullah has come back. Umar said, help me sit up. So Umar was propped up and turning to Abdullah, he asked him, what news do you have? Clearly, this was something that was bothering Umar and it was on his mind. He said, O leader of the believers, it is as you wish. She has given permission. Umar, he said, Alhamdulillah, there was nothing more important to me than this. Amr ibn Maymun, the narrator of this incident, said in other reports, سمعته لما طعن يقول وكان أمر الله قدرا مقدورا. The moment Umar was stabbed, I heard him recite the verse from the Quran, and the command of Allah is a certain destiny. As Umar's final hour approached, signs of agony began to appear on him. Abdullah ibn Abbas tried to relieve some of his suffering by saying to him, O leader of the believers, never mind what has happened to you. You were a companion of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and were an excellent companion and you parted with him while he was pleased with you. Then you were the companion of Abu Bakr and were an excellent companion and you parted with him while he was pleased with you. Then you were the companion of the Muslims and you were an excellent companion to them and if you 
leave them, you will leave them while they are pleased with you. Umar's response, however, took Abdullah ibn Abbas by surprise. It delineated the God-fearing nature of Umar that remained until his very final breath. Umar, he said, as for what you have mentioned about my companionship to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr and their happiness with me, then this is a favor from Allah upon me. As for my grieving which you see in me at this moment, it is over you and your companions. Umar's grief had transcended beyond his wounds and his injuries. He was anxious over the welfare of the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after his departure. Umar concluded with the following, Wallahi, law anna li tila' al-ardi dhahaban, laftaday to bihi min adhabi allahi qabla an ara. I swear by Allah, if I possessed gold equal to the earth in size, I would have ransomed myself with it from the punishment of Allah before I meet him. Reflect on who it is who is uttering these words. Not a disbeliever who had disregarded his purpose of creation. Not a criminal who had spent his life pursuing sins. Not an average Muslim who had fallen short of the very basics of Islam, ignoring and delaying all advice that he or she had received. This was Umar, the one guaranteed paradise on numerous occasions by the Messenger وسلم, himself. This is Umar. His palace in paradise was mentioned to him by the Prophet ﷺ. He had entered into the very dream of the messenger on numerous occasions. He was promised martyrdom by the messenger and was granted it as he was leading the believers in prayer. It was his weeping that could be heard by the Muslims at the very back of the masjid as he stood at the front leading them in prayer. It was he who scarcely slept by day, not wanting to neglect the rights of the Muslims and who barely slept by night, not wanting to neglect the right of Allah. He accompanied the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fought alongside him above the soil and was eventually reunited with him once again as he was lowered beneath the soil in Aisha's room. If these were the final words of Omar, then what are we to say? His son, Abdullah, describes the moment when his father came to utter his final sentence from this world. And he said, My father's head was resting on my thigh during his final moment. He said to me, Place my head on the ground. I said to him, What is the difference between my thigh and the ground, O father? He insisted, and he said, Place it on the ground. And so I lowered his head until it rested on the ground, i.e. wishing to be viewed by his Lord with mercy. Then I heard him repeat to himself, Waili wa waylu ummi illam yarhamni. Rabbi. Woe to me and woe to my mother if my Lord does not show mercy to me. And he kept repeating these words until he breathed his last. The Muslims crowded around Omar's soulless body as it lay on the bed before being lifted for burial. Some stood contemplatively, some praised him, and some were making dua. Abdullah ibn Abbas describes this moment by saying, As we were standing, I was startled by a person who took hold of my shoulders from behind me. I turned around and it was Ali ibn Abi Talib. He asked Allah Almighty to have mercy upon Omar and he said, addressing his corpse, There is no one whose deeds I would love to meet Allah with more than you. I swear by Allah I am hopeful that Allah will gather you with your two friends. This is because I used to frequently hear the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, Me, Abu Bakr and Umar arrived. Me, Abu Bakr and Umar entered. Me, Abu Bakr and Umar exited. And so I am hopeful that Allah will gather you with them. Indeed, they were together in every walk of life. And it was this dedication to the prophetic way which qualified Abu Bakr and Umar with yet another point of unity, their ages during their last days. Anas ibn Malik, he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away at the age of 63 and Abu Bakr died at the age of 63 and Umar died at the age of 63. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon you, O Umar, and may Allah gather us with you in Jannah. Your biography of integrity, humility, ambition, relentlessness in Allah's cause never ceases to amaze us. But then how can we be surprised when we remember who it was who raised you? May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.